Good morning and welcome to our First Christian Church Sunday service. We begin our service with a call to worship. People of God, open your ears. Come and celebrate the story of our God. A story of compassion and mercy, of redemption and love. A story passed down from generation to generation so that God's people never forget the wonderful things our God has done. Let's praise God together. Join me in our prayer of invocation. You let us choose, O Lord, between you and the false gods of this world. In the midst of the night of sin and death, wake us from our slumber and call us forth to greet Christ so that with eyes and hearts fixed on him, we may follow to eternal light. Amen. Let us pray together in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7, about God's goodness and Israel's ingratitude. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We, we will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. This concludes the first reading. Good morning, church. This morning we are going to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus is speaking. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. 
Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went out with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Thus ends our hearing of the word this morning. Will you join me in prayer? Creator God, in whom we move and have our being, thank you for inspiring us with your love, compassion, and wisdom. Grant that the meditations of all our hearts and the words of my mouth will always be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. The parable of the delayed bridegroom and ten bridesmaids is unique to the Gospel of Matthew. Though the Gospel of Luke has fragments of similar parables in chapter 12, 35 through 36, and chapter 13, verse 25, it is a parable difficult to interpret because Matthew's conclusion in verse 13 admonishes us to keep watch. But the issue of the story, according to disciple, preacher, and professor Fred Craddock, was not about watchfulness, or even staying awake. For the wise maidens, remember, also slept. Craddock writes, the issue is preparedness in the face of uncertainty. The wise maidens brought enough oil in their lamps in preparation for the unexpected delay of the bridegroom. Matthew's community no doubt lived with the hope of the return of the resurrected Christ. Craddock says, we do not know how widespread and intense the expectation of the imminent return of Christ really was. However, because many New Testament writers devote attention to the delay, we may surmise that such an expectation lay at the heart of the faith for many. Matthew presents then, says Craddock, a theology for the delay, for the ongoing life of the church in the world. Craddock notices it was the maidens who calculated an immediate arrival of the groom who were in trouble, but being able to know the day of the hour or the hour is not the issue. He writes, the issue has to do with responsible behavior in the meantime. Responsible behavior in the meantime may mean living an ethical life in the face of uncertainty. Craddock observes, after all, it is not the coming of the bridegroom that makes some wise and some foolish. It merely reveals who is. I have a photo book published in the mid 70s entitled what to do until the messiah comes on the cover is a black and white photo of a circle of youth in 70s attire jumping in joyous abandon the book enjoins the reader to be part of the works of service in the church 
and justice making with poetry, prose, and photographs. I keep it because it sat on my parents' coffee table for some time. But the sentiment of the book has always enticed and inspired me. The title of today's message is Getting Our House in Order. I'm not sure I shouldn't have changed the title given recent events. Where does the motivation come from to prepare when the future seems so very uncertain and the present so ugly? I suspect Matthew shared the same problem. Somewhere between 60 and 80 years following the events of that first Easter, there had been more lives lost to violence and the church lived under constant threat. The delay of the bridegroom to the faithful had to be difficult to endure and the anticipation intense. Waiting for salvation can be terrible. For some, waiting too long means they give up and go home. For others, the waiting creates a need for relief, however it can be found, a shopping trip maybe, uh, to replenish our tired lamps. For a few, the waiting is endured with complaint or wringing of hands, while others wait with hope, joyous anticipation, and preparedness. Matthew chooses the latter for the church. Over the radio, we have often heard, this is Tom Bodet from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Now until smartphones, Motel 6 didn't always know when to expect us, but whenever we might arrive, the light would be shining as welcome. That is the message of Matthew's parable for the church. I heard it expressed by Reverend Dr. Don Weeks, co-pastor of Connection Christian Church in Odessa, Texas, who led a recent regional workshop on congregations serving local neighbors. Weeks repeated several times in several ways the sentiment, we the church are called to shine the light of Christ on our community. I believe this is the active, hope-filled, and prepared waiting Matthew had in mind. And it has changed lives and invigorated the church in Odessa and across the ages. As we, First Christian Church of Bryan College Station, anticipate the process of search and call for a new settled pastor, during this time of transition, we are actively getting our house in order by discerning God's call to serve our neighbors. We are preparing our Lamps during a time of uncertainty, remaining hopeful that God is calling us to a future and a ministry. Our transition team is interviewing our ministry partners and community neighbors, searching for ways which we can deepen and widen our ministry, sharing the light of Christ on our community. We are asking why we exist in this place. What is our purpose? Who is our neighbor? And what has been and will be our legacy? When we have a greater sense of God's call for us in this time and place, we will be better prepared to find leadership that matches God's call for our future. For we do not wait passively or without hope. As most of you know, my father, the Reverend Dr. F. Wayne Bryant, passed away last Sunday on All Saints Day. Two days later, his five children and his wife of 20 years gathered via Zoom to hear the letter he penned in 2008, which was addressed to be opened upon my death in which he gave us instructions for his memorial and remains and tapped on a card on which he wrote his credo. He wrote this card, or actually typed this card, in 1961. 
It's a quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. I'd like to share it with you. That man is a success who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much, who has gained the respect of intelligent men and the love of children, who has filled his niche and accomplished his task, who leaves the world better than he found it, whether by an improved poppy, a perfect poem, or a rescued soul, who never lacked appreciation of earthly beauty or failed to express it, who looked for the best in others and gave the best he had. Our father was forever trying to put his house in order to make certain he was prepared for the unexpected and uncertain. He did so with a generous, loving spirit as a minister of the gospel and as a father. He believed in the light of Christ and taught us not to give in or give up, but to continue to shine the light of Christ on the world, working as healers, teachers, preachers, poets, administrators, artists, actors, craftsmen, computer geeks, librarians, and lovers of nature. He lived by his chosen credo. He kept the light on for us and still is. What is our credo as a church? What preparations are we making to keep the light shining on our community? How are we being responsible while we wait? How will we live in the meantime? Beloved, our light may continue to shine. May our lamps be full and our anticipation joyous. And let us eagerly go forward to embrace our future with God. Amen. Amen. As we move to our places to celebrate the Lord's table, we remember those who join us even when we are separated by self-isolation, distance, time, and yes, even death. We are united in our table of remembrance. Come, gather a piece of bread, a cracker or a cookie, and some liquid refreshment and let us prepare ourselves to receive wherever or however we may be God's gifts for God's people. good and gracious God, we wear beautiful crosses around our necks and hang them on our walls. We have made this triumphant sign of suffering into something decorative when what it really needs to be is defining. Help us to make uppermost in our minds the true meaning of the cross. In this, our weekly remembrance of Christ's death on that cross and our breaking of this bread. 
in lifting this cup of remembrance, we are lifting high the cross of Christ and proclaiming your great love. We partake with gratitude all the gifts that are made available to us through the crucified Christ. New life, real unity, eternal life, and a meaningful purpose. Let us show by the offering of our hearts, our hands, and our minds the depth of our commitment to live for him who died for us. In lives of sacrifice and service, empower our witness to Jesus Christ, whose cross so powerfully proclaims your love. Fill us now again with the power of your Spirit, that we might go forth as bold in our witness to Jesus Christ, till all the world adores his name. Amen. For I pass on to you that which was taught to me, that on the night Jesus ate in that upper room with his disciples, he took the Passover bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup and holding it up before his friends and followers, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you. As often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Now, my friends, go forth into the world to serve God and serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.